Todd with the Reason Files. The Reason Files has recently received a file containing documentation of sexual immorality scandal plaguing the new IFB, specifically Stephen Anderson and his Faith Ward Baptist Church. Included in this file was an audio file of the Wednesday night service from July 1st, 2020. In the service, Stephen Anderson addresses the situation and the scandal. Uh, the situation, for those who are not aware, involves several teenagers from Faith of Word Baptist Church and at least three adults, ages 18 to 21. Most of these people, including one 18-year-old, were involved in private online chat groups. Uh, in this chat, these teens and one adult discuss sexual immorality, including raping underage girls, having the pastor's son teach sex education to underage church children. They went on to talk about not simply fornicating with the underage children, and bear in mind that the 18-year-old adult was also talking about this. They also talked about choking to unconsciousness the girls that they were raping or fornicating. They also talked about tying these young girls up and forcing them into depraved sexual acts. They talked about their activities outside of this private chat group. And these activities included fornication between the 18 and 21 year old adults and the 12, 13 and 14 year old young girls. Perhaps the worst thing of all, even worse than the lewd photos and graphic drawings and depraved discussions all in the chats is the boys, including the 18-year-old adult male, were clearly and obviously grooming the younger girls for sex with them, teaching these young girls that they would enjoy it and so forth. Much of it's too pornographic to even describe. In the sermon, you will hear Stephen Anderson clearly state that the pornography that these boys and adults were involved in is nothing more than some PG-13 stuff. In other words, Stephen O. Anderson clearly minimizes the situation. Stephen Anderson and his wife responded in a private chat with the parents of these young girls who had been victimized. The Anderson's response was to tell these parents that their children are the real perpetrators, that they were just as wicked and guilty as the boys who were talking dirty to them and grooming them. When these parents told Stephen Anderson about their adult son's involvement and the 21-year-old adult involvement, Anderson immediately denied this and called these parents wicked railers and false accusers. Uh, Stephen Anderson also stated that two of the adults were not part of his church and therefore not his problem. Stephen Anderson is given knowledge of potential child molestation occurring, pedophilia, and his response is along the line, uh, not my kid, not my problem. This I don't care what happens to children attitude is also expressed in the messages you're about to hear. Finally, Stephen Anderson put his foot down and told the mother of one of the young girls. They were a bunch of loudmouth women, told them that they were not allowed to talk about it anymore. And if they did, they would be thrown out of Faith Word Baptist Church. In less than 48 hours after making this ultimatum, Stephen Anderson publicly threw the families out of the young girls who had been victimized by his own son and their friends. At this point, we now present Stephen Anderson's secret Wednesday night message, which he did not want anyone outside of his personal congregation to hear. Stephen Anderson is attempting damage control character assassination of the victims and the families and the weaving of a false narrative designed to make him and his family appear to be the victims in all this.
for our announcements. If you know the bulletin, look up your hand nice and high. We'll get you with one. On the inside, we've got our service time Sunday mornings at 10.30 is our preaching service. Sunday nights at 6.30. Wednesday nights at 7 is our Bible study. We've got the story times listed there below, as well as salvations and baptisms. Congratulations to the Taylor family on the birth of baby Joshua. And then uh, don't forget the final installment of the tea party is this Sunday. So um, if you haven't already RSVP, there may still be room for that. So uh, be sure to update your RSVP if you're not able to come. The Bible remembrance passage is Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. And then uh, also keep in mind that uh, the coronavirus cases are rapidly increasing in the state of Arizona. In fact, I think per capita, Arizona is kind of leading the nation in new cases. So we don't want to uh, become too slack on that or just kind of think like, oh, you know, that's over. Because, um, you know, one of our church members was in the hospital and almost died. So, you know, for the God, that, uh, you know, the Lord healed him and, and got him through that. But, you know, I, I'm just constantly hearing from a lot of people in our church that people at their work are getting it. And a lot of our people right now are, are quarantining from the church because they've been around people at work who got it. And so if you do come into contact with somebody at your work or anything and, and it's later find out, it found out that they have it, then, uh, you know, be sure to wait 14 days before coming back to church if you know that you've been exposed to it. And, and so that's what a lot of people have been doing. We appreciate that. So uh, just make sure that you keep doing the fist bump and, and uh, wash your hands, be careful about that, etc. And uh, that's about it for announcements. We're actually just going to go ahead and roll uh, straight into the sermon. And so let's go ahead and pass the offering plates if we have them, and then let's have Brother Nick come and read the scripture tonight. I want to get right into it tonight. And you know, I just I just want to warn people right now that you know I'm I'm going to be dealing with some serious issues tonight, some garbage that's been going on, and I am very angry, and I'm going to rip some face, and I'm going to be taking people to task and calling people names. And let me tell you something. If you don't, you know, if you don't want to be here, if you're like, whoa, I was just looking for a, a you know, the joy bells and a nice Wednesday night service, then, you know, honestly, there's nothing wrong with you sitting this one out if you want to just take off, if you don't want to be here for a rough sermon and dealing with some things. But I'm just telling you, I, I am as mad as a hornet right now, and I'm not going to be taking any crap from anybody, and it's going to, it might get a little ugly tonight. So buckle your seatbelt, and if you and if you if you'd rather not be here for this, you can sit this one out. And also, I might go kind of long tonight. So if it gets to be, if I get, you know, and maybe I won't go long. I don't know, but I'm going to say everything that needs to be said tonight, no matter how long it takes. So if we get an hour into it or something, and you got to go to work tomorrow, you got to go. Don't feel bad if you need to get up and walk out. We're not just going to assume that you know you got mad and left or something. So, you know, if you need to leave after 45 minutes or an hour or something, no problem. I'm not trying to be here to hold you hostage to something, but I am going to say everything that needs to be said tonight, and I'm not leaving until I've said everything that needs to be said. Okay, so just, I'm just warning you, full disclosure. Brother Nick, would you come and please <laughs> It's Romans chapter 2, sorry. Romans chapter 2 in our Bibles, Romans chapter number 2. Romans chapter 2. Therefore, Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same thing. For we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? For despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and intended heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who are patient, continuous, and well doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality. 
eternal life, but unto them that are contentious, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first, and also of the Gentiles. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first, and also to the Gentiles. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their faults to me while accusing or excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hath the form of knowledge, and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself, that Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, Thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. <laughs> Dear Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight. Lord, we thank you for your judgment. And Lord, we just ask that you bless Pastor Anderson and so much your spirit tonight, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So before I get into the sermon tonight in Romans chapter two, you know, I want to start out by just talking about a few bad things that are going on in our church. And this is not being live streamed to the internet or anything. This is just for you guys here. I'm speaking about this. And I just want to start out and just explain what's going on because there, there are two situations going on right now. Okay. Now, the first issue is that a few days ago, it came to my attention that a whole bunch of teenagers in our church, a whole bunch, not a few, Big group of teenagers have been on this like private messaging social media deal that we didn't know about. Okay, because we don't allow our kids to be on social media. I know a lot of other people in the church don't allow their kids to just have unfettered access to the internet or be on social media. But sometimes kids find a way around these things, and they were in this group and they they were talking about all kinds of garbage. Just a bunch of filthy stuff, just dirty jokes, and just a bunch of just inappropriate, offensive junk. And basically, it's just a bunch of idiot teenagers getting together and just one-upping each other. It's like the junior high locker room and all of this just one-upping and shock value and dirty stuff. And here's the bottom line. It's, it's, it's wicked, it's wrong, and two of my kids were involved in it. Isaac and Don were two of them and a whole bunch of other kids in the church, okay? And here's the thing, as soon as I found out about it, you know, I came down like a ton of bricks on my kids. I gave them severe punishment for being on there and and, and talking all this garbage and trash and, and it's, you know, I was horrified by it, okay? You know, because of the fact that I didn't know, like, where are they getting this stuff? Where are they hearing it? Where are they learning this stuff? Where is it coming from? 
and how did they even have access to this when we thought we had blocked everything and whatever, okay? So, you know, I found out about this a couple days ago, and so here's what I did. You know, I punished my kids severely, took away their privileges, and they're not going to have access to this stuff going forward, and you know what? To me, they, they said they're sorry, they submitted to the punishment, but to me, that's the end of you know, what else can I do at that point? You know, and here's the thing. They weren't out fornicating. They weren't out being drunk. They weren't out producing pornography. They weren't out vandalizing or looting or rioting in the streets, okay? Did they sin? Yes. Was it wicked? Yes. But here's the thing. I punished them. Ask them if I let them off the hook. Guess what? They didn't get off the hook. They got severely punished. Okay, so that's the first thing. And here's the thing. Every parent of every child who was in this chat group, all the parents were notified, all the parents were told, look, this is what's going on. They all saw it. They all said, you know what, we're gonna deal with this, we're gonna deal with our children. Every kid involved was disciplined. Every kid was taken to task. And to my knowledge, I mean, I know mine were for sure, okay. But here's the second issue, is that now, People just want to use this as an excuse to just bash me, bash my wife, bash my children, and just hurt our church as much as is possible. That's the goal, is just to trash our church. And here's the thing, it's not enough to them that I said, as soon as I heard about this, when someone brought this to me, you know what I said? I said, man, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. You have to tell me about stuff like this. My, if my kids are doing this, I gotta be able to punish them. I gotta put a stop to this. I wish I would have known about this sooner so that I could come down on it. And I said, I'm sorry about this. I'm gonna punish them. I'm gonna take care of this. Okay. What else am I supposed to do? But here's the thing. So you have these people though, that's not enough for them. Here's what they want. Here's what they want to have. Okay. They want the whole chat history to be released publicly to the whole world. Now, can somebody explain to me, and the, the kids in this chat are 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and one of them in another state is 18. The kids in our church are 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 in this chat, and they're saying, oh, we gotta release this publicly, so everybody needs to read up. Now, who here, is it, and they wanna bring it up in church, and who here wants to read a bunch of dirty jokes by a bunch of junior high high school? Who thinks that we need to pass that around and just, we need to know exactly what the dirty joke for? Look, a bunch of filthy junk is what it was. A bunch of garbage is what it was. Okay, there, are you happy? If you want to know what it was, just go down to the theater and watch the PG-13 comedy movies that they're playing down there and they'll have all the same smut and filth and garbage in them, okay? So here's the thing. People want to take this and just use this to basically just throw shade on our church, attack me personally, attack my wife, and this is what people are lying and saying. I didn't hold my kids accountable. Now, I don't know what people want me to do. Kill my children? Is that what they want me to do? They didn't fornicate, they didn't get drunk, but they said all these horrible, filthy things. So what are, what are we supposed to do? Kill them? That's not enough. We gotta expose this to the whole world. You know why they want to expose the whole world? Because they're a bunch of smut dealing gossip columnists. That's what they want to do. They just want to be a busybody and rebel in all this. And you know what? And and I I don't want to go on and on about that. I'm gonna get into this, but, but let me let me explain something to you, okay, about my job as a pastor. And I'm gonna get into the sermon. But let me explain something to you about my job as a pastor that you might not know. And even my wife doesn't really fully know is that a big part of my job as a pastor is hearing about the filth and garbage in people's lives. Now, I'm not a Catholic priest. I'm not operating a confessional booth. But guess what? There is not a week that goes by where someone does not come to me, whether it's one of my listeners from all over America or all over the world, or whether it's one of my friends here, or whether it's one of my pastor friends, there is not a week that goes by that someone doesn't come to me and tell me stuff that's either worse than this or way worse than this. Every single week. I spend hours and hours on the phone every week trying to fix problems, trying to help people here, other states, other pastors, deal with 
with all these horrible things. And guess what I don't do? I don't tell the sordid details of other people's lives to other people. You know what I don't do? I don't reveal everyone's sins to other people. You think that I should get up and reveal the sins of every church member? Every time a, a church member is into something, well, we just got to put it out there and tell everybody. That is garbage. That is nonsense. Okay, and look, if I did that, we'd be here all night with all of everybody's dirty laundry and junk. And you know what? It's wicked. Now, here's why I would never do that. Number one, because of the fact that it's wrong. It's immoral. When people come to me for help, when people come to me for counsel, you know what? They're trusting me to be their friend, to love them, to care about them, not to hurt them. And so when they come to me with these things, it's told to me in confidence. Even the law recognizes this. It's called clergy privilege. It's just like attorney-client privilege or physician privilege that when people come to me, that information is supposed to be safe with me. That I'm not supposed to repeat that. I'm not supposed. So that is not right. Now look, are there certain situations where things need to be called out publicly? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are situations where people have to be thrown out of the church or something, and it ends up having to be a thing. Hey, we're calling this person out of the church. And guess what? We never do. We never film that and put it on YouTube. Now, some there's always some idiot. There's probably some idiot here right now with their cell phone. But there's always some idiot who pulls out their cell phone and just starts filming when we're dealing with, you know, having to throw someone out. But I'm not the one who uploaded that stuff. I've been accused of, whoa, why'd you upload that when you threw that person? You know why I don't upload that stuff? It's because people frequently repent and get right with God and come back. They frequently repent, they get right with God, they come back. And you know what? At that point, if you have one Christian bone in your body, you should understand this great big concept in Christianity called forgiveness. Yeah. And you know what? We have thrown people out and reinstated them more times than I can count. I could name tons of people, but I never would. But did you know what? It's over. Amen. It's dealt with. It's over. And look, a guy like Johnny Romero, yeah, that needs to be blasted publicly to the whole world. You know why? Because that's a public figure, a pastor, who was literally snorting cocaine and going to prostitutes. Now look, if a pastor is actually going out and doing those, that needs to be called that his reputation needs to be permanently ruined so that he doesn't pop up in some small town somewhere pastoring someday. That, that needs to be published. But you want to publicly ruin the reputation of a 13-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old? Now, who here can admit, and my hand's up, that I said a lot of stupid things and did a lot of stupid things as a teenager that I hope nobody ever finds out about? <laughs> oh, and look, I never, I never got drunk or fornicated or anything, but you know what? Guess what? We're all sinners, and I did some really stupid and really embarrassing things that I would hate for people to know about every idiocy I did as a teenager. And you know what? These teenagers are stupid, and they don't realize that in the age of social media, you know what? The internet never forgets. And, and you know, the stakes are a little higher nowadays when young people screw up, because when young people screw up now, it gets all over the internet, and you can't even expunge it from the internet. You might as well. I told my kids, I said, you know what? If you're going to type up all this... this garbage, you might as well engrave it in marble. You might as well engrave it in a stone monument. Because that's how electronics are. And so I, you know, to, 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 and I, one of these idiots who, who is saying, we got to expose this public, blah, blah, blah. You know what? I said to him, I said, well, what about all the other garbage that I hear about every week? He said, well, you ought to be exposing all that too. Okay. That's ludicrous. Now, I want to deal with a bunch of specific issues tonight, scripturally, regarding this issue and regarding how I feel about all this. Okay, first of all, let's look at Romans chapter 2. Okay, in Romans chapter 2, verse 11. And again, like I said, this, this is going to get ugly tonight, so... And don't worry. When I say it's going to get ugly, I'm not going to expose you to any smut. Because I'm not somebody who thinks it's profitable or righteous... To, to, to forward smut to everyone so everybody can see how bad everybody's sins were. I personally am not into that. So I, don't worry. I'm not going to defile your kids' eardrums tonight with smut. But I'm just saying it's going to get ugly because I'm going to name names, I'm going to rip face, I'm going to call people out, and I'm not... Uh, the gloves are off tonight. 
Romans chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, for there's no respect of persons with God. And that's why I say you can leave at any time and nobody's going to look down on you if you just decide to go out for ice cream or something. Romans chapter 2, verse 11, there's no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now why read this passage? The first point that I really want to drive in tonight is the fact that there's this double standard a month older than now and a month a lot of people where they think that basically anything that you did before you were saved, oh, that's what you Oh, you, you didn't grow up in a Christian home? Oh, well, then, yeah, I mean, everything that you did, I mean, well, you know, of course. I mean, you grew up in a world like, oh, of course you did all that stuff. But then if you, but, oh, 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 everything that you did after you were saved, oh, you know, and, and, oh, you grew up in a Christian home? Well, then, you know, you're just accountable for everything. And then, but, th but then anything that was from people who were unsaved just get a pass. Now, of course, there's a, there's a kernel of truth in this. Obviously, to whom much is given of him shall much be required. And obviously, people who grew up in a Christian home, they have a more of an advantage in life. But let me explain something to you. Everything I did after I was saved is under the blood, too. Amen. Oh, that was before they were saved. I saw the blood. Everything I did after I was saved. I got saved when I was six years old. Okay, so unfortunately, only the stuff I did before I was six is under the blood. I only get passed for that. But then, what we have is people who just want to just give a total pass for all the stuff they did when they were young because they didn't grow up in a Christian home. But then kids who grow up in a Christian home, they better walk on water. Now let me let me explain something to you about this. Okay. Romans 2 just said that unsaved, unchurched, Gentile people out in the world know the law of God. Is that what it said? It said the law is written on their hearts and their conscience bears them witness, either accusing or excusing them, and they have the law written in their hearts. They're a law unto themselves, and as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law, and there's no respect of persons with God. That's what the Bible actually says. And let me tell you something. Everybody in this world knows that it's wrong to murder. Everybody in this world knows that it's wrong to steal. Everybody in this world knows that drunkenness is wrong. Everybody in this world knows that fornication and adultery are wrong. I don't care what anybody says. You will never convince me that worldly people don't know that those things are wrong. You will never, because that's what the Bible says they know. You mean to tell me that only saved Christians, only people, Christians, know not to kill, and not to steal, and not to drink, and not to commit adultery, and not to take drugs? Is that what you mean to tell me? Because I promise you that there are millions of people all across America who've never gone to church in their life and are being raised in a totally secular home who have never drunk a drop of alcohol in their life. There are millions. I guarantee you that there are millions who will go to their wedding altar a virgin without setting foot in church, without ever being a Christian. And I guarantee you that there are millions who will never take drugs, millions who will not commit adultery, millions who will not murder or have abortions or any of these other things. Let me tell you something. Unsaved people know what's right and wrong. Just like saved people. I don't care if you're Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, Muslim, Christian, Catholic, whatever, people know right from wrong. And you know what? If you grew up and you lived a wicked life when you were growing up, and you went out and partied and got drunk and fornicated, that's your fault. You did that. You did those things. You did them. Yeah, you. Oh, but I didn't grow up with Crystal. Hey, you grew up on God's earth. And God's Spirit convicts the entire world of sin. That's what the Bible says. The whole world is convicted of sin. The whole world has the law of God written on their heart. And so, you know, it, it got me thinking about, you know, all the BLM stuff with the privilege, white privilege. It's like a Christian privilege. 
pastor's kid privilege. You know, and, and here's what, let me tell you something. I've been at this thing for a long time, and I've never met a holier than thou who didn't live a raunchy, horrible life before they got saved. Every single holier than thou Pharisee that I've ever met lived a horrific, raunchy, super sinful life before they got saved. But that was all before they were saved. I mean, they didn't know better. Now look, I'm not trying to hang anybody's tax over their head. I don't think those things should ever be brought up. But let me tell you something about that. I'm not trying to hang Christian kids tax over their head either, though, am I? Right. Right. See my point? Amen. I'm not up here saying, hey, let's hold unsaved people accountable for their sins. Here's what I'm up here saying. I'm saying that when people sin and repent and get it right, it should be the same standard. It shouldn't be like, yeah, but you're a Christian kid. You don't get to do that. You should know better. Well, everyone should know better. And you know what? So, so here, this is what one of these idiots, James Foster. And you know what? James Foster is a worthless piece of crap, and I've got a lot to say about him tonight. I got a lot to say about him tonight. So if you don't like that, you might want to just sit this one out. Here's what that worthless piece of garbage said. He said, even in my most wildest sinful days, I didn't take it to this level. Anybody believe that? So he's, he's uh, so bastard kid out of wedlock, drunkenness, drugs, fornication, partying, but he never told a dirty joke. He never sent a bunch of dirty text messages. He never got in the locker room and talked a bunch of filthy smut. But that's okay. It, I mean, it's okay that he did all these other things because he didn't, he didn't have a filthy conversation. Now, folks, you know what that is? That is minimizing his own sin. His, his turd doesn't smell, but everyone else's does. That's what that is. So people who go out and literally physically fornicate, physically take drugs, physically get drunk, are going to look at a Christian kid who says a bunch of filthy things and then say, well, I never did that. It's, folks, it's a joke. It's ridiculous. It's insanity. But that's how these holier than thou art. You know, isn't it funny how people can go out unsaved and have a bunch of children out of wedlock and go out and take drugs and drink and party and have sex with a whole bunch of different people. Just have sex with a whole list of people. And then when they get sick of all that, because they've already done it all and they've already indulged in all that garbage for years and years and years, and then they finally realize this is empty. This is vanity. This doesn't bring me any joy in my life. This is a stupid way to live my life. I'm going to live a better way. And then when they're 30 or 40, all of a sudden now they want to settle down and live for God. And then they're ready to just turn around and just throw everybody in the trash who even does something even close to what they did. Not even doing what they did, but just anybody who does anything bad. But then here's what they say. We well, have yeah, to grow up in Christian home and I didn't. Hypocrite. Holier than thou garbage. Okay, isn't it amazing how all your, you, it's so easy for you, you know what? Guess what? Growing up in a Christian home, I grew up in a Christian home. Now I didn't grow up in a pastor's home, thank God. And I feel bad for my kids growing up in a pastor's home. But let me tell you something. I could all the crap that they have to go through. And I'll get to that later. I got a lot to But let me tell you something. Hey, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents loved me and took me to church and taught me the Word of God. And I'm very thankful to them. I love them and have a great relationship with them. And they're uh, two of my best friends. Are my mom and dad. I talk to them frequently. I love to spend time with them. And you know what? I was raised in that Christian home, but guess what? I had to, I, I had to endure the temptation myself. Growing up, you know, I had to abstain from fornication. And guess what? I had the same temptations that kids down at Tempe High School are having right now. Unsaved kids, saved kids alike. You know what? Is there even a school called that, or am I just making that up? What? Yeah, Tempe High School. Yeah, because I looked up one time a bunch of statistics about the kids down there, because I even made this point in another sermon, that even a bunch of the unsaved kids are not, are not drinking and not fornicating and not doing all that. Okay, and, and here's the thing, is that just like at Tempe High, there's girls throwing themselves at the guys down there. Guess what? I went through those same temptations as a teenager of the lust of the flesh. I had, you know what? Just like they're being offered alcohol and offered drugs, 
I was off an alcohol and drug many times. Okay? Just like they're tempted to cheat on their exam and steal and lie, I had all those same temptations. Okay? And I'm not saying that I was perfect or sinless, but I still had to navigate that minefield of going through childhood and teenage years and school and peer pressure. And, well, you just grew up in a Christian home. You know, I still had to work at being a Christian. Okay? It wasn't, it wasn't just handed to me. Just like it's just like these people. Oh, your white person grew up in a in a nice middle class area. Everything's handed to you. No, it wasn't. Who's a white person here that just feels like everything was handed to me? You, you probably have worked hard and struggled and, and worked to pay the bills, just like we all have, right? So I went through all those same struggles. I went through all those temptations. And you know what? People around me were also raised in Christian homes, and they're falling all around me. People around me looking at porno, drinking, doing drugs. You know what? And they're going to be growing up in Christian homes because all the same temptations are there. Okay? And you, and you have to fight those temptations. And you know what? There are unsaved kids who fight those temptations and win the battle. There are saved kids who lose that battle and vice versa. Because you know what? It has to do with having character to do what's right. And I'm calling out anyone as a mega hypocrite who lives a rocky, sinful path. And then want to turn around and just say, Oh, I can't believe what these teenagers did. This is just and it's like, okay, what they did is wicked. I'm not trying to say that they didn't do anything wrong. It was very bad. That's why I discipline them severely. But no, I'm not going to kill them. No, I'm not going to just throw them in the trash can. And no, I'm not gonna let you ruin their lives. Because I don't believe that their lives need to be ruined. I'm glad that my life wasn't ruined for the stupid stuff I did as a teenager. And I guarantee you, anybody with an honest heart right now is probably thinking back to the stuff they did as a teenager. And thinking, yeah. You know, thank God there was no social media back then. Now, what it, look, look what the Bible says in Romans 2.5. For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall so not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not the uncircumcision which is by nature if it fulfill the law judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? Again, just showing that there could be some worldly people that could even live a cleaner life than Christian people because everybody knows right and wrong. Okay. Is the air conditioner on in there? I'm for, is it just me? I might be a little hot under the collar right now. All right. Let's just make sure it's on. Just in case. But anyway, here are some things. Turn to it to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me tell you about some things that my kids have to deal with that other kids don't have. Since you think my kids have so much privilege and, and they just have everything going for them in life? Well, let me explain some things that my kids have to deal with that your kids don't have to deal with it and then most pastor's kids don't even have to deal with it. Because you know what? Not only are my kids pastor's kids, they're the kids of a famous pastor. So they have to deal with even more junk that goes along with that just because of the fact that I'm well known. And so, how about, how, try this on. How about this? How about a couple months ago, when a grown man in our church walks up to my 14-year-old and says, so, what's been going on in your house? What's Solomon up to? You been getting in trouble? Who's the, so, people, a lot, of, a lot of spankings at your house? Who's getting spanked at your house? Folks, this is the kind of crap that is just constantly, because people just, they want to attack me, and they target my children, and they want to go through my children. Just, they're just like, literally pumping my children for information about my family, what's going on in my family, who's getting, you know, what's going, you know, just trying to find stuff they can use. Because I have people all the time come up to me and start asking me all these weird crying questions, and I'm just thinking to myself, I know what you're doing. You're just trying to get the dirt on me, going to my kids and grilling them and trying to get information from them that they can use against them. That's, and, and people befriending my kids and ingratiating the, themselves with my kids just so that they can corrupt them and just so that they can destroy them and just so that they can use them to get a foothold into my house. Weird, sick of fans, weird of right. Now listen, how about this? Try this on. How about... The girl whose family moved all the way to our church from a different distant state with the express purpose that they wanted their daughter to date one of my sons. Amen. Okay. And they bring her over and she uh, gets with Solomon 
And you know what they do? They they have Solomon over their house all the time. And we thought these are godly, nice people. They they oh man, they're my biggest fans, and they love our church, and they love our family. And you know what they did for literally years? I didn't know this at the time. I found out later. For years, as they're buying gifts, flattering him, telling him how great he is. And you know what they're doing? They're bringing him over to their house and telling him, Hey, listen, Solomon. You know we know your parents have these rules. But over here, you know what? You can watch whatever movie you want over here. You can watch whatever you want, and we're not going to say anything. You know, that's between you and them, but, you know, here's the video cabinet. Here's what you want. And, you know, we don't, you know, we're not as strict, and your parents are a little bit too strict. And they're taking him and just telling him, break all the rules, and just slowly, like a frog in a hot water, poisoning him against us, all the while pretending to be our best buddy. All the while, just pretending like they love our church, they love us, that we're so great, we're their friends and everything, while they're just slowly poisoning our son against it. And then, all of a sudden, come to find out, these people have produced guilty videos. While they're independent fundamental Baptists, they're putting out videos that are being sold on a porn site. Isn't that wonderful? And these are the people that come into our church just so they can get their daughter with my son and flatter him and, and tell him how great he is and, and tell him break the rules and tell us, hey, you don't have to listen to your parents, you? you know, go ahead and do this and whatever. That's what that's the kind of garbage that my kids have to deal with, that yours might not, because you know what? People don't move across the country to come and screw with your life and target your children and try to infiltrate not just your church, but even your family. I mean, I'm so disgusted by it that it, it made me think to my, it, it made me tell my kids, like, it, I told my sons, I said, any girl who's chasing after you, just stay away from her because, you know, there's so many people that, I said, you need to go find one that you went and found. I told, I told them, find one somewhere else it would be the best thing, probably. That's why I told my son Solomon. Because I said, I, you know, because there's just so many people that just, that just come here to infiltrate our church. And, you know, the, the Internet's a, a great blessing because we can reach a lot of people. You know, we've got visitors from all over. You know, the Internet's a great blessing to be able to reach people and it's look as small as the world. But you know what it also does, though? It also just puts a big target on us right. for everybody who wants to just come just to damage and harm our church and harm my personal family. And how do you think that makes me feel? You know, it's like, I look, I love our church. I love people. I love lost souls. But, you know, I love my family, too. And, and, and you know what? I, I'm looking at the damage that, that's happening to my family, and I'm asking myself, is this even worth it? You know what I mean? With the damage and, and the target that's on my family and the garbage that's going on, it just it makes me wonder if it's even worth it. But anyway, let me move on here. It, it, you know, so, yeah, my kids might have some privilege, but guess what? They also have to deal with a lot of hard things and obstacles right. and bad things that you can't understand. Because you're not in their position where everybody, you know, you know what? They are the ones who have a whole bunch of people just staring at them and looking at them and watching them and drilling them, waiting for them to screw up so that they can jump all over them. Yep. That's what's going on. And why? Because they hate me. And they know that, hey, I can get him through his kids. Let's go after his wife. Let's, you know what I mean? Just to try to get in there any way that they can. Now, look, look what the Bible says. Here's a, look. These, these wicked people who want to just, oh, we got to put out this whole text thing, just put it all out there and let everybody read all of it. Okay. Well, look, at, look what the Bible says. I want to point this out. 2 Corinthians 2 5. But if any have caused grief, he have not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrary wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch. Sorrow. Now, this is, so what did this guy do? Did he send a bunch of filthy messages? Or did he sleep with his father's wife? This guy did something horrible. This guy committed literal fornication with his father's wife. 1 Corinthians 5, the story's there, amen? That's what he did. Now look, my kids. Yes, they committed a major sin. And I'm not minimizing the sin. But, you know, when people are trying to blow it out of proportion, though, 
and try to act like they went out and actually committed fornication or adultery or produced porn or looked at porn or something? Both. That's not what happened. Okay? And the bottom line is that this guy actually did something horrific. He actually did a horrible thing physically, not just talking about a bunch of dirty smut. Okay? And what does the Bible say? Well, hey, you need to you need to forgive him. He's already been punished. He's been punished. So let's forgive him and show your love to him so that he doesn't get swallowed up with over much sorrow. But we're just supposed to throw 13-year-olds in the past, 14, 15, 16. And you know what? I wonder if these idiots stop to think about this, especially the girls that were involved in this, okay? That maybe they could get super depressed from this and commit suicide? That that thought ever enters their mind? That people, could, that teenagers whose who private dirt got put out publicly, young people, children, teenagers, that if that got put out publicly, they could maybe commit suicide. Or get an eating disorder, or whatever. Who knows what they're, what kind of damage you're going to do. Just just blasting them, and ruining their reputation, and all this stuff. Why do you want them to be swallowed up with over much sorrow? If they've been severely disciplined, and there's repentance there, it's time for us to do the Christian thing and move on. I'm not interested in having my nose rubbed in this anymore. I've had my nose rubbed in this for the last two days, and I'm done with it. You want to rub my nose in it? You can go jump in a lake. Yeah. You ungrateful jerk. You want to rub my nose in this? You know what? Get out of here. I'm done with it. I, I apologize that this happened under my watch. I dealt with the problem. I, and you know what? You want to know who's making excuses are the same people that are attacking me right now. Because you know what? I just said, hey, my kids are guilty. They were wrong. I'm in a of them. But you know what all these people are saying? Yeah. They're saying that their kids were peer pressured and they they they, they just you know, they just got caught up in it. Well, you know what? I could call that same crap because this, this group had five people in it before my kids even got added to it. So couldn't I pull that same crap up? Well, they just got brought in and good. No, but you know what? I'm not saying that because my kids are guilty because anyone who part everybody in there, 13 through 17, that's old enough to know right from wrong. Anyone who's 13 to 17 is old enough to know that that stuff is wrong and that they shouldn't have been involved in that. Period. And so here's what I said. I said everybody who was in there saying dirty things is guilty. Everyone's guilty. And you know what? They got mad at that because they said, "No, you're, you, you know, you're not taking responsibility because it's only these four kids that are guilty, and not the rest." When they all said the same kind of stuff, they all said horrible things. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, you're accusing me of not taking responsibility. I'm the one who took responsibility. Other parents have taken responsibility and disciplined their kids. The only people that I question whether they actually disciplined their kids are the people that are calling their kid a victim. That's who I'm wondering if those people discipline their kids because they just think to themselves, oh, well, you know, they're a victim of peer pressure and they got bullied and caught up in it and whatever. That's baloney. You are responsible for your own actions. Peer pressure is not an excuse. You can't hide behind that. We've all been peer pressured in our lives. And you know what? You don't have to give into that. My kids are peer pressured. Your kids are peer pressured. That's not an excuse. Okay? And, these, and then also, here's another thing that people got mad at before. Because there were people in the chat, okay, not my kids, there were a couple of kids in the chat that said something where they said something about going to hell. That they were, you know, that I'm going to, like they said about themselves that they're going to hell. Like that I'm going to hell. And here's what I said. I said, hey, those parents need to really sit down with those kids and make sure that those kids are safe. But I'm getting lambasted for saying that. What kind of an idiot, what kind of an idiot would hear somebody say out of their mouth, I'm going to hell and not doubt their salvation? What in the world? Is this an insane asylum? Hey, you know, I, you know my dad, when I was growing up, my dad, he liked to tell a lot of the same stories over and over again. And he has, he's, a, he's, he's literally the best storyteller I know. So we like to hear his stories over. He's got some great stories. But man, my dad, he would always tell the story about this guy at church that got provoked and got mad at him and screamed at him, I'll see you in hell. And my dad just stopped and said, you're going to hell? (laughs) (laughs) 
And you know, my dad told me, my dad told me, he said, well, it's just made me instantly think that this guy's not even safe. And why is he saying he can't see me in hell? What is that? And look, I'm not saying that those kids who said that aren't safe. I'm not saying that at all. But you know what? If, if my kid said that, I would want somebody to tell me, hey, you need to check this kid's salvation. Because they're saying this and it made it sound the way that they were saying this and the things that they were saying. It made it sound like they might not understand the gospel and might not be saved. I mean, is that a weird thing to say? Yeah. And you know what they said? That's an accusation. You accused my kid not be. You know what's funny? It's sort of like when people visit our church and we check their salvation and then they get offended. Right. How dare you check my salvation? You know what's funny? I've never been offended by someone checking right. my salvation. Right. Never been. I've had soul winners knock on my door and I loved it when they checked my salvation. I visited churches and had them check my salvation. And you know, I had no problem. No problem telling them. Yes, I'm saved. How do you know? I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. All my faith is in Him. I can never lose my salvation because Jesus paid it all. I have no issue telling you that. Why? Do you, do you ever think it's a little weird when you're out door knocking and you ask them what they're saying and get real defensive and angry? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you concerning the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. So look, that's not an accusation. What? How is that an accusation to say, hey, look, I'm disturbed by these statements. Let's check their salvation. That's, that's all I said. You know what? That's correct. And I'll stand by that. That if anybody makes jokes about that they're going to hell, I, I've never joked about that. I don't think that's a normal thing to joke about. No, I'm not saying that they're unsafe. I'm just saying that it's a red flag and we need to sit down with them. And here's the thing. You know what? It wouldn't be the weirdest thing in the world for a 13-year-old or 14-year-old or 15-year-old at our church not to be safe. You think that that's just a crazy idea? And it doesn't mean that they're not going to get saved later. Because, you know, their parents are bringing them here. Maybe they zone out for a lot of the preaching. Maybe they're young, immature, not paying attention, not that into it. And, you know, maybe when they're 17, 18, they'll click or whatever. Folks, I'm not saying that they're bad or that they are an infiltrator or a reprobate. Because, you know, they're a kid. They're being brought here by their parents. Maybe they haven't made the gospel their own yet. Maybe they haven't made Christ their Savior yet. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? I mean, isn't that reasonable to at least say, hey, better safe than sorry. But you know what? It says something about somebody's heart they freak out at that. Why is that so touchy? Why is that such an accusation? When it's just saying, hey, you need to check that salvation. I mean, I feel it's even stupid even say. It sounds so stupid when I say it out loud. So look, I don't want young people, or anyone for that matter, swallowed up with over much sorrow. And you know what? Even Donnie Romero, who, you know, frankly, you know, well, I don't even want to say how I feel about Donnie Romero. Okay, but it's bad. I'll put it that way. But look, even that guy, who definitely deserved to be called out and had done horrible, wicked things and just, wow, right? Horrible. You know what? I, I was out there. You know what I was doing when I was out there? I, you know, I was dealing with all the problems in the church. But you know what? I spent about two hours plus every single day for a week, either at his house, in his living room, or at restaurants, talking to him or her or both. And I sat in their home, I sat in their living room with them. And you know what? I counseled with them and tried to help them get through this because I was afraid that one or both of them could commit suicide. I was afraid that they would commit suicide. That one of them, or both of them. So I, I was worried about that. Even though these are people that, you know, I mean, I don't even want to go into that. I'm just saying, like, you know what? I was thinking about, you know what? We need to make sure that as we're dealing with this and dealing with sin and fixing this, that we need to make sure, though, that people don't hurt themselves or, or go, you know, uh, over much. Because you know what? These type of things can be real damaging. And you think you think it'd be the first time a teenager made a suicide or harmed themselves in some way because of the fact that they're humiliated or something got put all over the internet about them or something got released to the internet, some text message. 
I wonder if we just Googled it. I didn't Google it. I wonder if we just Googled it. Teenage suicide text message. I wonder how many hits we're going to get. Does anybody think about that? Does anybody give a crap about that? Does that thought cross anybody's mind? Idiots. Verse 8, Wherefore I beseech you that you should confirm your love for him. For this end did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgave anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, of whom I forgave it, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Right? So we don't want Satan to get an advantage of us. We don't want people to be swallowed up with over much sorrow. We don't want to overdo it or overreact. Yes, we need to come down hard on sin. Yes, we need to punish. But then we need to forgive and give people a chance to move on and live it down. Here's a great verse. Psalm 25. You don't have to turn there, but verse 6. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they've been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth nor my transgressions, according to thy mercy, remember me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Now turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 5. Remember not the sins of my youth. I think we've all prayed that prayer. I think everybody's prayed that. Everybody who read that song is like, underline, highlight. I think that song is always said after everyone, even those who grew up in a Christian home and lived a relatively clean life. Hey, we none of us wants the sins of our youth brought up. All of us have humiliating, embarrassing, stupid, sinful things that we did, myself included. Myself included. But there's these people are like the tattlers and busybodies. You see, here's the thing. There are certain problems where they, they concern certain people. And it doesn't need to just be everybody's business. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? It's like, you know, all the parents, every parent involved was notified and brought into this. But then people are like, no, they're contacting pastors and other... The fosters are sending out this text me- the, the, the actual text messages themselves are being sent to pastors all over America by being fosters. All my pastor friends are getting this in their inbox and stuff like that. Just this tattler, busybody. Just I, 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 I was wondering, like, is like that probably illegal? Are you getting private text messages from minors? Like, what? It certainly makes no sense. It's certainly not ethical. But look, the Bible says, and you know, the biggest loudmouth in this is that like, the only male involved in this is David Foster. But it's all just these loud-mouthed women. My kid, you know, defending their kid in mama bear mode and just laughing out at everyone else. Okay, but but I want to bring up one in particular. But but here's what it says in first, and I told you, I'm not pulling any punches now. As far as you're not going to do it, it's going to be work. First Timothy 5.13, with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattler is also a busybody, Speaking things which they ought not, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Busybody women, idle, tattlers, gossipers, loudmouth, just talking trash because they're not doing their job in the home. I mean, listen to this. So here we are in the midst of all this, right? My wife gets a photograph email to her yesterday. Have you seen this? Here's what the photograph was. It was a picture of my son Solomon, who was not involved in any of this, had nothing to do with this. He's working as a plumber, doing a great job. He's living his life. No issue with him. Not part of this whatsoever. We got a picture in our email of my son Solomon age 17, now he's 18, but when he was age 17, with a 17-year-old girl wearing a skirt down to her ankles at Magic Mountain in Los Angeles. You know the roller coaster park, Magic Mountain in Los Angeles? Have you seen this? Because this has been, this has been going, this picture's been going around. 
And 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 my wife said, why are they saying these? I said, I said, honey, I'm the one who took that picture. <laughs> I took that picture. Yes, it's true. My 17-year-old son was on a date with a 17-year-old girl at Magic Mountain in Los Angeles, California, with me and the girl's mom and her grandma. <laughs> and her sister and we rode roller coasters and I snapped that beautiful picture so my wife responds yeah my husband took the picture he was there I mean, you know, what's the issue well I just thought you should know about it <laughs> what is, this is the kind of crap that my family has to deal with Bunch of busybody tattlers. Now look, the, the number one, the person who's guilt, the, the most guilty person here, okay, of this is James and Katie Foster. Okay, and let me just tell you about the Fosters. Tell you about these wonderful people, the Fosters, who have sat there and taken it upon themselves to just go against the wishes of a whole bunch of these other parents, because there's a whole bunch of teenagers. They're like, hey, look, we're going to punish our kids. We don't want this crap out there. We don't want their reputation permanently to, to have it. We don't want them getting Googled and this what You know what I mean? It's just stupid. They're kids. They're teenagers. And, and, but, but no, no, no. They, the fosters are going to send this all over and, 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 and send it to all my pastor friends. And he said, quote, he's going to send it to every single person he possibly can. Send it to everyone. And I said, well, you know, what about the fact that your son is in the chat saying some of the worst things? Literally. I said, your son is in the chat right here. Look at these horrible... And, and here's what they said. Well, our son, you know, this is what Dane said. Dane said, well, my son's super wicked and I don't care. He deserves it. His son's 13. And then, and then here's what she said. Well, what he said was actually pretty tame. And, and you know, pretty mild compared to what other people. And it wasn't. It was. It was of the same. It was of the same caliber. The same stuff. And it's just like. And, and it's just like. Oh well, you know. And, and here's what that tells me. You don't even love your own kid. You don't even care about your own kid. Like, like you're so interested in attacking Pastor Anderson and attacking faithful Word Baptist Church that you're willing to just put your own kid dirty laundry out on the internet if it means punishing Pastor Anderson. And let me tell you about these people, the Fosters. You know, isn't it interesting when the whole oneness thing was going on with Tyler Baker? They were the most gung-ho oneness right there with Tyler Baker and the rest of them. Who remembers that? Just gung-ho oneness all the way. And then as soon as, at the last minute, once the battle was over and everybody's thrown out, all of a sudden at the last minute, it's like, Oh, no, 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 we're so sorry. Oh, we got we got tricked. We got fooled. Oh, you know, whoops. We're with you, Pastor. Because they just want to stay and do more damage. And these are the same people who decided to move into a house 150 feet from mine. How do you think I like that? Do you think I'm comfortable with that? And you know what? This guy came up to me and said to me, Hey, Pastor, I'm moving into this. I, I want to move into this house. There's a rental house that's for rent, it's not even a, a home to buy, it's just renting. And he's like, oh, hey, I, you know, it's, it's really close to your house, I just want to make sure that you're okay with that. And I told, I, I said, well, let me look at a map, you know, to, you know, and see how close we're talking here. You know what I mean? And I looked at it, I said, no, that's too close. I said, I'm not comfortable with that. And he said, okay, then I won't move in there. And I said, good, thank you. And two days later, a moving truck pulled up and he moved in. After he lied to me and said he wasn't going to. You think that I want these kind of people living 150 feet from my house so that they can spy on me and watch me and try to find something with me or my kids or whatever? Okay? And look, I am not... And you know what? I know people get all offended. Well, why can't we all live on your street? Whatever. <laughs> I don't want to live in a yellow submarine with everybody. I'm not interested. That. I don't want to have a compound. This is not a cult. You know, some people come here, they want it to be a cult, and they get disappointed when they find out it's not a cult. It's a normal sense. Look, 
And at the time, and by the way, at the time, there were like three other houses for rent on my street, and they were telling people, hey, you can get this out here. They were trying to get other people in church to all move into my street. And look, I'm not comfortable with that. And not only, not only did they move in 160 feet from me, they have the whole church over to their house every week. I'm not even going to ask for a raise of hand who's been to their house, because I know it's every it's a single person. I could ask for a raise of hand who's never been to their house, just give me like a couple of hands. But I'm saying, I'm just saying, they have half the church at their house, and I'm not mad at you if you went to their house, because you, you, maybe you just didn't, you didn't.